Hey brothers and sisters, the title of today's message would be Project Ezekiel, the mystery of Gog of Magog revealed. And so the reason for this message is I strongly believe that the Lord might have just revealed to me a very important nugget for the body of Christ concerning how the things of the end times are going to play out in his scriptures. Now, this is not the full 100% picture, but another puzzle piece to the grand plan of what God is doing. And the reason why I want to share this with you and I think it's so important is because when it comes to the prophetic words that many of us have received from the Lord or heard being spoken by his prophets of today, there are two houses that we hear. We hear, we hear the one of promise where God says that he's going to fulfill promises in your life and that he has not done with this world yet. And then we hear the other side of judgment where God says that there's going to be judgment and destruction on the nations uh, for because of sin. And so sometimes this could be very this can be very difficult for us to conceive um, as to how both can be relevant because that's what I stand on. I stand on the fact that I believe both sides are true, the righteousness and the judgment of God. And we see this when it comes to the book of Exodus, how when God was bringing judgment upon the pagan nation of Egypt, he still protected his people in the city of Goshen and made sure that their property was taken care of and that his people were taken care of. So this, by the very understanding of that lesson in the word of God, it teaches you, it, te it teaches me, it teaches everyone that God can still bless you and fulfill every single one of his promises, even though he is releasing judgment upon a doomed nation, which Egypt was at the time. And so I feel and I believe that at the end of this message, that you're going to get a very detailed and depth under, in-depth understanding of how God is going to fulfill all things concerning his plan of restoration. Now, as I said before, this is not the full picture. It's a high level picture and it's only a small puzzle piece of the big puzzle. All right. And so without further ado, let's go ahead and kick off with this study. So let's start by going into um, Revelation chapter 19. This is the King James Version. Uh, so to give a summary of what Revelation 19 is about. So, all right, so what we see here is that after the defeat of Babylon, we are taken to John's vision that he has in heaven where there is a great celebration going on. And that is because of God's judgment upon Babylon. And so during this time in Revelation 19, we learned that it is declared in heaven that the marriage supper of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready, which is the saints of God. And it speaks of how she is arrayed in fine linen, which symbolizes the righteousness of the saints. John then sees heaven open and Jesus arrayed as a king of kings coming with the saints with him to defeat the beast and his army and then cast both the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire alive. This is the key thing. It's the highlights that is happening here in Revelation 19. And so now key verses we want to pull from this is the following. We see in verse 17, and it says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts. And the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And in verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophets that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that have received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And we know this to be the second death. And in verse 21, and the remnants were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which uh, sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And so these, the reason why I want to capture these scriptures from Revelation 19 is because this is a reference to events that happened in Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39. And so 
and Ezekiel 38 and 39, taking pieces of verses from this book, from this chapter, we learn that Revelation 19 speaks of the same exact event. And Ezekiel 38 and 39, for example, it has one of the scriptures which says the following. It says, Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel. This is when he's speaking against Gog and Magog. He says, Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands and the people that is with thee. And it says, I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. And in the verse, another verse in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it says, And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, it says, Speak unto every feathered fowl and every beast of the field, and assemble yourselves and come, gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. Ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty and, and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, and of goats, of bullocks, and all of them, fatlings of Bashan. And it says, And ye shall eat fat till ye be full, and drink blood till ye be drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. Thus ye shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots, with mighty men, and with all men of war, saith the Lord God. So this here, when we read Revelation 19 and capture those um, critical verses, we learn that in Ezekiel 38 and in Ezekiel 39, it is highlighting what is happening in that time frame in the book of Revelation. So it, it makes it as a type of a marker point to understand when we're moving into the Magog events. So when we see the Magog events that is spoken of in, in uh, Ezekiel 30 and 39, it is captured to the very point in time in Revelation 19 leading to the end. And so what I want you to pick up from this, which is important, is that in Revelation chapter 19, it says only the beast, right? We capture the fact that only the beast and the false prophet is cast into the second death, which is the lake of fire. Satan is, con is allowed to live, shall I say, quote unquote, live or rather be imprisoned in a bottomless pit for a season. So the events that happens in Ezekiel <clears throat> in Revelation 19 is an end time event that fulfills one of two important, I would say, I already used the word event. I don't want to keep using the same words over and over again, but it, uses, it fulfills one of two phases. There we go. One of two phases when it comes to the Magog event. So the Magog event is a two-phase process, brothers and sisters, is a two-phase process which lasts for 1,000 years. So the first phase is accomplished in Revelation 19 with the defeat of the beast and the false prophet. And so we saw how in Revelation 19, it, uses, it uses, utilizes the key words which speaks of the fowls of the air, where we go to Ezekiel 38 and 39, we also match that same scripture in there. All right, so it's a two-phase event, brothers and sisters. You had the first Magog event in the beginning, just before the millennial reign, and then a Magog event at the end of it. The phase one event of the Magog event has the false prophet and the beast. In the second phase of the Magog event, you have Satan. And you will see in scripture right now why I came why I came to 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 this revelation, to this to this knowledge. So when we go to Revelation 20, King James Version once again, here's a summary of events that's happening here. And so after John saw what happened to the beast and the false prophets in Revelation 19, he then witnesses an angel coming down from heaven and bound Satan into the bottomless pits for 1,000 years. So during this time, Satan can no longer influence the affairs of mankind as he has done since the time of Adam and Eve, who were the first of mankind to be deceived. And so in Revelation 20, there's a resurrection of the dead, which occurs of God's saints in which they reign with Christ for a thousand years. 
Then after a thousand years is up, Satan is once again released for a season and is able to influence the affairs of mankind at that time as he has done before and gathers the nations of Gog and Magog and more to overtake to try and overtake God's people who is enjoy, who enjoyed a time of peace on the earth. And so later on we learn in the scripture that God destroys Satan and the invading nations with fire from heaven then afterwards commences the judgment of the dead judgment day and so key verses that we take from revelation 20 is as follows right in verse 2 it says and he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and satan and bound him a thousand years and it says and cast him into the bottomless pit the same pit where the false prophet came out of Right, And it says, and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nation no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. So what it's saying here is that in the same way Satan has been deceiving and influencing the wickedness of the nations in our current age. After the thousand year period, he would be permitted to do the exact same thing. All right, and so moving on, it says after this he will be loose for a little season, and they live and reign with. And it, this is another verse now. So we finished that part that spoke of Satan. Now speaking of the saints, the beheaded ones who are resurrected in the first resurrection, it says, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So that thousand years and the ruling and reigning of Christ is a time of peace in Israel, the time of the unwalled villages. The time where the people have rest and are not afraid of their of the enemies coming against them. And in verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And in verse 7 it says, And when a thousand years are expired, which means when a time of the unwalled village peace in Jerusalem, the peace and the reign of Christ is on the earth, the millennial reign of Christ. So at the expiration of a thousand years, it says that Satan shall be released out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations. So the way that the world has been deceived right now, after the thousand year reign, Satan will be able to do it again. Now, not to everyone, right? Not to the people of God, but to those who are left after the first phase of the Gog Magog events, which um, involves the beast and the false prophet. And so it says, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations. So he's going to work a thing to deceive the nations. And it says, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is at the sand, as the sand of the sea. And then moving on, um, in verse 9, it says, And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And a devil that deceiveth them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beasts and the false prophets are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So it's interesting how right here, after the thousand years is over, Satan is released to deceive the nations once again. And then it speaks of Gog and Magog after the thousand years of Christ. This is after the defeats of the false prophets and the beasts. And so when Satan is defeated in this phase two of the Gog Magog events, guess where he is sent? He is sent into the lake of fire where the beasts and the false prophet are. This Magog event is a two phase process, brothers and sisters. The first, I keep repeating over so this way you remember, the first is the beast and the false prophet. Then comes the millennial reign of Christ. And then Satan's release to deceive the nations again. Gog and Magog once again, because the scripture says it. And what we just read, Gog and Magog. Once again, Satan is going to deceive 
the nations, influence the nations to evil, to come against a city without walls, a city that has experienced a time of peace. So now we have this understanding, then we see how when God says he is not done with his plans for the earth yet, that he truly is not, which confirms the prophecies that has been spoken that God still has much for his creation to do. And so can he fulfill the same thing in our lives in the thousand year reign? Well, yes, because the scripture speaks of how when the millennial reign of Christ begins, it says that I could pull the scripture and I'll share with you towards the end of this, where it says how that if a person dies at 100 years old, it's as if that they died prematurely. So not only would there be a resurrection of those who died, who were beheaded, who rule the reign with Christ. So even during the tribulation, for example, if you did not come to Christ or you did not get your life right with God and you were left behind, we'll say, right? You will still be resurrected back after defeat after the defeat of the beast and the false prophet. God will still call you back if you receive him as Lord and Savior. And then he will still fulfill his promises he's spoken into your life during the millennial reign of Christ. But it will be his promises, his way. And so now let's look at Ezekiel 38 and 39. Speaking of what, in regards to what we just learned. So in Ezekiel 38, in verse 4, it says, And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine armies, horses, uh, and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And then it goes on to say in Ezekiel 39, Therefore thou son of man prophesied against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So when you read the scripture, it's easy to miss out on the details. Uh, you, you can easily read over the important meats in this verse right here. But when you allow the Holy Spirit of God to walk you through the scriptures, he will quicken you to understand things you missed before. Like, for example, note how in Ezekiel chapter 38, the Lord says in verse number four, and I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaw and I will bring thee forth. I would turn thee back. What does that mean, brothers and sisters, when the Lord says, I would turn thee back? In Ezekiel 39, it says in verse 2, and I would turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee. So to turn back a thing, right, it means that you was going, you came to a place, then you begin to move away from the place. And if you get turned back, it means it's, you're returning back to the place from whence you came. In other words, he is bringing Gog and Magog back to Israel again after they fleed from the, from the Lord to the north. So when did the fleeing happen? This happened in Revelation chapter 19 when the beast and the false prophet came against the land of Israel and the Lord defeated him because he's the king of kings and lord of lords. And then they flee to the north. And the Lord says that he would turn thee back, which means that phase one, I defeated you and you fleed. But in phase two, I'm going to put, I'm, I will put hooks in your jaw and I'm going to draw you back. Gog and Magog, you're coming back. So when did they flee the first time? Let's go to Ezekiel, well, not Ezekiel, Zechariah chapter 14. And it says the following, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, riffled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Now, understand this. In the Gog of Magog event, which is the phase two event that I'll be speaking of right now in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it is spoken of from the sense that 
they came back from war. Israel came back from war. They were an unwalled city. They were enjoying peace and prosperity and God was taking care of them. This is a millennial reign. And then later on, when they will come against Israel, right? That we learn, we're going to learn and that we just learned in Revelation chapter 20 and the phase two event, when Satan brings Gog and Magog into Israel, guess what? This unwalled city is protected by God and God calls down fire from heaven and destroys Satan and his army for good. That's Ezekiel 38 and 39. But guess what's happening here in Zechariah 14? Is Israel an unwalled city? Is Israel protected? No. Verse 14, once again, brothers and sisters, Ze uh, Zechariah 14 says that behold, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord cometh and they and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken. In the phase two Magog events, the city is not taken, but the Lord fights for the city and defeats Satan. But in the in the Magog event, phase number one, right? The beast and the false prophet shall have their way with Jerusalem. For the scripture says that the city shall be divided and Jerusalem shall be taken. And it speaks about the houses being raffled and the women shall be ravished and how half the city shall go into captivity. But then verse 3 says, Then shall the Lord, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So this time of Zechariah 14, verse number 3, this is the time of Revelation 19, when the Lord comes in the clouds um, with the saints on horses and fights against the beast and his army and defeats them. So Zechariah 14 verse 3 where it says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. That is the Revelation 19 phase 1 Magog events, brothers and sisters. And it says, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west. And there shall be a very great valley. In other words, when Jesus touches down on the Mount of Olives, you know where when you see an earthquake, there is that crack, that long line that begins to open up. Right, the little cracks that this the scene that you see when the earthquakes begins to break open a land. It is saying here that when the Lord touches down on the Mount of Olives, that scene, that earthquake is going to split horizontally from the east to the west. And then it says, next, and half of the mountain shall move towards the north, and half of it towards the south. So there's going to be a split that's going to move the mountain terrain, right? The mountain, uh, the terrain of that territory, where it's going to move it north to south. And it says in verse 5, And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains. So those who came, the, the beast army that came against Jerusalem in the phase 1 Magog event, they're going to flee to the mountains to the north. And so remember how in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, it spoke about, I just spoke about how the Lord says he shall turn them back. So this here is the fleeing that happens during the time of the beast. But then later on in the time of Satan, the Lord shall draw them back. And it says, for the valley of the mountains shall reach up unto, unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. So in, Eze in Zechariah, in Zechariah chapter 5, in closing of verse number 5, it says that the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. When we go to Revelation chapter 19, 
right? Let me scroll back up to the scripture so I can speak to you about it again if I could find it. All right, so I got it right here. And it says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now check this out. It says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in linen, fine linen, white and clean. And so we know that the fine linen linen was given to the saints because the fine linen represents the righteousness of the saints. And so when we go back to what we just read in Zechariah 14, verse number 5, it speaks about the fact that in the same manner, it says, Lord, it says, and the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with me. So this particular event that is happening right here is touching and highlighting the Magog phase one. And then in verse 6 of Ezekiel chapter, I believe it was a 13. Alright, so in chapter 38 39 of Ezekiel, it mentions this one particular scripture, and it says, And I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And so when it says, I will send a fire on Magog, right this here is the same fire that we read in revelation tap, uh, chapter 20 where in verse 9 and it says and fire came down from god out of heaven and devoured them because if we begin in verse 8 it says and shall go out to, to deceive the nations as a satan which are in the four quarters of the earth gog and magog to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And so when we read this in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, it's telling us that that portion of the scripture we just read about the fire coming down out of Revelation 20, because we said Revelation 19 captures the phase one of the Magog event. And Revelation chapter 20 captures the phase two of the Magog event. So in the phase two of Magog event, Revelation 20, the Lord speaks of fire coming down from heaven and devouring Satan and his army, the uh, Gog and Magog invaders, right? And so we just learn in Ezekiel in ch chapter 38 and 39, where it makes mention that the Lord shall send fire fire to devour the armies of Gog and Magog. And then in another verse in the Ezekiel 38 chapter, uh, chapter 38 and 39, it says the following. It says, after many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword in other words, a land that was subjected to Zechariah chapter 14 fulfillment that we just read. It says that thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people because remember they were sent into captivity against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Because we know that in the time of the millennial reign of Christ, 1,000 years, the beast and the false prophet is defeated, and Satan is locked up in a bottomless pit. No more to buffet and torment the people of God for 1,000 years. So in this portion of scripture that we just read in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it speaks of the latter years, which means a late time towards the end. And it speaks about the, the fact that the people of Israel is brought back from the sword, Ezekiel 14. And that they shall dwell safely, Ezekiel 14. 
and then how we also learn about the millennial reign of Christ in Revelation 20. So this here is telling you, brothers and sisters, it's telling me that this is the phase two of the Magog fulfillment. And so then when we go to another verse in the Ezekiel 38, 39 chapters, the reason why I, I mention them the way that I do 38 and 39, because I believe that you can actually just combine these two chapters as one, since it seems like 38 is a continuation well, 39 is a continuation of 38. So this is why I say 38 and 39. If you read through these two chapters, you can find these verses that I'm referencing. And so at another one, it says, Thus saith the Lord God. This is Ezekiel 38 and 39. It shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. So a few things here. Because of man's sinful nature, right, in this current age, it is easy for, for Satan to influence the minds of mankind to commit evil. But during the thousand year reign, Satan will be locked up and will no longer have that ability to influence man towards evil as he began in the Garden of Eden. But when he is released for that short season, he can influence man again, deceiving the nations, leading them to do evil. And so we remember how in Revelation 20, it spoke, uh, it spoke of how well, I have it right here. Let's touch on this real quick. So Revelation 20, as a reminder, it says, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And so he bound him in a bottomless pit. And it goes on to say that he should deceive the nations no more till the one thousand years should be fulfilled. And it goes on to say that he'll be loose for a little season. And then afterwards, in verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. So he deceives the nations, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle. So why is this important? When we go back to Ezekiel 38 and 39, Looking at this verse that I spoke of, it says, Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and that shall think an evil thought. See, mankind is always thinking evil thoughts. This is why Jesus had to die for us to save us from ourselves, from our sins, so we're not condemned to hell and so when satan is no longer influencing man then there is no influencing of evil thoughts but here in ezekiel 38 39 it says the same time shall things come into thy mind and thou shalt think an evil thought this is the time when satan is loosed and is able to influence the nations and deceive them once again to attack the people of God. And so what was this evil thought? That he would go against a land of unwalled villages that has found rest and that dwells safely without walls. So this here is a connection that Satan is going to influence the Gog of the phase two with an evil thought when he's loose for a little season and convincing many other nations to come against the people of God. But we know what the end result would be. Where in phase one, the Lord allowed Jerusalem to be taken. So the people of Israel, for, for God's people, will repent. And then the Lord came and fought in that day a battle against the beasts and the false prophets. But this time, when the Lord draws Gog back from the northern parts, it will be a swift, 
It would be a decisive, swift victory as the Lord will call down fire and consume them. And so now another part. All right, check this out. Another thing that it says in another verse in Ezekiel 38, 39, it says, And thou shalt come against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. And I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctifying in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, and check this out, brothers and sisters. It says, Are thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied to those days many years that I will bring thee against them? So this Gog figure, this Gog figure is a figure who shall appear at the end of the 1000 year reign of Christ and he shall be the one that the prophets of old Ezekiel and the like has been speaking of and so in Revelation 21 now things are going to get a little better so we talked about the hard stuff now we're going to see what's going to what do we have to look forward to after the thousand year reign of Christ. Revelation 21. So the summary of Revelation 21. Following Satan's defeat. His final defeat. Where he's cast into the second death. And judgment has been carried out on all who ever lived. John witnesses the birthing of a new heaven. And a new earth. Free from every trace of evil that ever existed. He sees the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, and he is permitted to see the holy city and describe the beauty of it. And some of the key verses you want to take away from Revelation 21 is as follows. And it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God and it goes on another verse that we want to capture from Revelation 21 it says I will give Unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Now, here's the references here to... Ezekiel 39 briefly so where it says in Revelation 21 that the first heaven and the first earth were passed away when we go to Ezekiel 39 we see why it passed away we're talking about the end of the phase, the end of the phase two of the Gog Magog when uh, when the first earth and first heaven has passed away and it says in verse 19 of Ezekiel 39, For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken, surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of, of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. So during the time of God unleashing his final judgment on Satan, this will also be the judgment upon the first heaven and first earth, wiping it all away making way for the new heaven and new earth which is completely free from any trace of sin and evil and then when we go to let's talk about ezekiel 40 now 
In Revelation 21, it says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. Well, in Ezekiel 40, verse 2, it says, Now, mind you now, Revelation 21 is post-phase 2 Magog. And so Ezekiel 40 says, In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain, by which was as the frame of a city on the south. We just read in Revelation 21, where John says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. So this here, brothers and sisters, the fulfillment of Revelation 21 is after the phase two Magog event. After the millennial reign of Christ. So another reference we have here to Ezekiel. Let's go to Revelation 21 once more and read a highlighted post. Revelation 21 verse 2, it says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And then it says, I saw no temple therein for God, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Well, going back to verse 40, right? Let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 40. So from Ezekiel chapter 40 to the end of the chapter, it is the new Jerusalem that John is speaking of here in Revelation chapter 21 onward. It's the new Jerusalem that is described as a place not built by the hands of man, but by God himself. So now, check this out. In verse 22 of Revelation 21, it says, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. Well, have you noticed that in Ezekiel chapter 40 towards the end, the Ark of the Covenant is not mentioned anywhere. It's not mentioned anywhere concerning the design of the new Jerusalem at all. Why? Well, the Ark of the Covenant was built in the time of the Old Testament as a foreshadow of God dwelling among men in the future as he just declared it in Revelation chapter 21 when he says, Behold, the, tab the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. So the Ark of the Covenant was only a foreshadow of what God was going to fulfill in Revelation 21, post-phase 2, Gog and Magog. And, it's, and it says also a reminder that God and the Lamb is the temple, because they are what the Ark of the Covenant was symbolizing all along. Now check this out, concerning the temple, the purpose of the temple, the tabernacle, all circled around the building, the building of a house for the Ark of the Covenant, where the Spirit of God resided in, in the time of the first and second temple. The reason why the first and te second temple was ever built, the tabernacle was ever put up, was for the Ark of the Covenant to build God a house. So now that we see the fulfillment of the tabernacle of God dwelling with man, the ark is no longer necessary because God will literally dwell with man. All right, so still in Ezekiel, right? In the book of Ezekiel, between chapters 40 towards the end, where we learn of the design of the temple of God, created not by human hands, but by the hand of God. It goes on in verse 5, where it says, verse 4, and it says, And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gates, whose prospect is toward the east. And then Ezekiel uh, goes on to say, So the Spirit took me up, and brought me into the inner courts, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house, and I heard him speaking unto me out of the house. You hear that? 
The glory of the Lord filled the house, and I heard him speaking unto me out of the house. And the man stood by me, and he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredoms, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. So you see here is that what we just read in this portion of Ezekiel and what we just read in Revelation 21. This is the millennial, not the millennial, I'm sorry. This is the temple that God is going to bring forth from heaven in which he created himself. So there is no temple there. because remember, the ark makes the temple what it is. There's no point in building a temple if the Ark of the Covenant is not in there. This is why, for example, in our day and age, with Israel seeking to build a temple, a third temple, makes no sense. Because number one, first of all, the Lord has already became the sacrificial lamb once and for all that takes away the sins of the world. So still making sacrifices for sins in that caliber is useless. And number two, the temple will still be empty. It would just be another building if the Ark of the Covenant is not in there. But yet many people would, would debate that. Oh, they know where it is. They have it in secret, but whatever. <laughs> it's all good. Just pressing on. All right. So we're almost finished, brothers and sisters. So Ezekiel 44, it also says here to add more support to what we just learned. But the priests, the Levites, the son of Zadok, that keep the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. So the son of Zadok will have the opportunity to enter into the Holy of Holies, where the Lord himself will have the soles of his, of his feet resting upon to dwell with his children in Israel. They will have the opportunity to go in and minister before the Lord and eat with them at the table, the wedding supper of the Lamb, the table. So when it comes to the mystery of the sons of Zadok, the Lord knows exactly how he's going to make that manifest. I don't want to get too deep into it because it's beyond any of us to truly know what the Lord is going to do concerning the sons of Zadok and how that's going to bridge in with um, the people of God. And so now we're approaching toward, we are approaching towards the end of this message, Revelation 22. So the summary here is that in this chapter, John sees the tree of life and the river of life and describes it and its purpose. He then concludes with final words from the Lord speaking great exhortation for the people of God of what they have to look forward to. And the key verses I want to pull from this is that is the following. And in, in verse one, it says, and he showed me a pure river of water of life. Clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And verse 2 says, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yield her fruit every month. And yield her fruits every month. I said that twice, and a third time, and yield her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So now let's go to Ezekiel chapter 47 and to speak about another phase in his journey in his uh, vision where he's being led to see the temple of God the, well the new Jerusalem not ba not made by human hands and it says afterward he brought me again onto the door of the house and behold waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward the water of life we just learned of in Revelation chapter 22. And it says, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under from the right side of the house, at the south side of the altar, 
Then brought he me out of the way of the gates northward, and led me about the way without unto the utter gates, by the way that looketh eastward, and behold, there ran out waters on the right side. So this is the pure river of water that's coming out the throne of God. And it's and Ezekiel seeing it coming out of the house from the east side into the rest, uh, west side, left into the right. So this is the same water spoken of in Revelation 22. And it continued on in Ezekiel 47, it says, Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were many trees on the one side and on the other. What did we just learn in Revelation 22? It says in verse 2, In the midst of the streets of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. And it said in verse 8, Then said he unto me, These waters issue out towards the east country, and go down into the desert, and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come uh, thither, for they shall be healed. And everything that shall live, whether the, uh, whether the river cometh. And in verse 11, But the merry places thereof, and the marshes thereof, shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. So the water of life is spoken of in Revelation 22. And we are seeing some more implications as to how it would be utilized in Ezekiel, by reading Ezekiel 47. And in verse 12 says, and Ezekiel 47, And by the river upon a bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meats, whose leaves shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. And it says, It shall bring forth new fruits according to his months. Remember how I repeated that phrase in Revelation 20, 22 three times? It's the same tree. And it says, Because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be meat, uh, shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. This is the same tree of life in Revelation 22 that will be used for the healing of the nations. And so, brothers and sisters, this concludes the message. And I really do hope that you was encouraged by what the Lord has revealed in his word concerning how he's going to roll out the plans from now until generations to come. Yes, we're going to enter a time of trouble, the time of the beast, the time of the false prophets. But understand that while the world is preaching doomsday, the end of the world, that the world is going to be destroyed and that's going to be the end of it. It's a false rumor. The rumor is not true. Yes, there's going to be trouble. Yes, there's going to be judgments. Yes, there's going to be the overthrow and destruction of nations. But through the ashes shall the Lord give birth to a time of his people. A time for his people to receive every promise he ever had made for them. Every good thing that he has purposed for their lives. To the fact that even during the time of trouble, if we perish in Christ, he shall raise us up back once again in the resurrection. And in that resurrection, he will continue to fulfill every single promise he has ever spoken into our lives. And so the Old Testament has many cool passages about what the millennial reign of Christ was will be like and so in concluding this I want to I want to leave you with a reading from Isaiah chapter 65 beginning in verse 17 and it says for behold I create new heavens and a new earth and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind but be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. 
and I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the bless of the Lord, and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bulik. And the dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt, nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. May the Lord Jesus bless you all, and thank you for listening.